In this video, we get to hear Dr. Katherine Pittman, the co-author of Rewire Your Anxious Brain, How to Use the Neuroscience of Fear to End Anxiety, Panic, and Worry. Now, this book has got thousands of reviews on Amazon, and it's also therapist recommended. So if you can't find a therapist near you, then this might help you find the answers on what you can do on your own to help rewire your anxious brain. So here we are with Dr. Katherine Pittman. So let me know, what are we working on today? So we're going to be working on trying to help people figure out how it is that we can control anxiety in the brain. And when we talk about anxiety in the brain, we're lucky because it is one of the disorders, one of the difficulties that we face that has the most research and the most evidence about how it is caused and how we can impact it. So I feel very fortunate to be able to, to talk to you today about how we can change anxiety and control anxiety because we've learned so much and we do understand what causes it in the brain and what it is that we can do to actually change our brains to change the levels of anxiety we experience in our lives. So what we'll start with today is to talk about if there are really ways that you can control your anxiety. And yes, in fact, if we do use and apply the understanding that we have about the causes of anxiety difficulties, we can really work to overcome the limits of anxiety in our lives. One thing I will start with that free people frequently ask me is, is, um, are, is everyone equally anxious? And that is not true. No, everyone is not equally anxious. There are individuals who are more anxious than others. And just as we have individuals who are more anxious than others, you'll probably recognize you have dogs or cats or even there's even rats and, and other animals, horses that have differential levels of anxiety. And we've found that there are genetic influences involved here. That is that some individuals and animals are more naturally anxious than others. And we can, we can detect this early on in their lives. But because anxiety is also learned, we have to also con consider the fact that we have a way that we can modify the brain so that even a person who is born anxious can reduce their anxiety if they know the proper processes to use to do that. But anxiety is also learned through life in a way that individuals who aren't naturally anxious often will have experiences that lead them to become anxious. We see individuals who suffer from abuse or trauma often become more anxious after those, those circumstances have occurred. And our brains are, are designed to detect what is dangerous in our personal lives and to identify those dangers and to respond to those dangers. So it's a good thing that we can learn anxiety and that we can learn fear. But the important thing is to know that our brain is very changeable throughout our whole life. Our brain can adapt and change and, and even fears that seem to be somewhat built into humans like fears of animals are readily overcome. The fact that some of us are sleeping with our pets every night lets you know that the human brain is capable of overcoming a lot of what we might consider natural or instinctive fears. So bottom line, we can teach our brains to be less anxious. And in fact, the fact that we understand, we know quite a bit about anxiety in the brain and what causes anxiety and how to change it is going to help us a great deal. The very first point that I want to make with you is don't blame yourself for your anxiety. You are going to learn that anxiety is a complicated process. And if you think you are completely in control of it and that you should blame yourself as having some kind of a character flaw that leads to anxiety, then you're only going to make your anxiety worse. So a very important lesson is don't add to your anxiety by also blaming yourself for anxiety. The next thing is to keep in mind that if you can understand anxiety and understand how your brain creates it, it's going to give you better access to tools and strategies that you can use to change anxiety. And then finally, number three, you're going to need to practice and learn these ways that you can change your brain. And when your goal is not simply to reduce your anxiety, which some people mistakenly think is the goal, if you just say, I want to have the least anxiety possible right now, you're not going to be able to change your way, your brain as effectively as if you make the focus and the goals that you have to the goal to be to change your brain so your brain is less susceptible to anxiety.
So learning how to change your brain so it's less susceptible to anxiety is going to be our ultimate goal. We see that there are two sources of anxiety in the brain that are very important to understand. The first source is a part of the brain called the amygdala. And actually, we have two amygdalae on the left and the right side of the brain. And this, this part of the brain, which we typically just refer to as the amygdala, is the part of the brain that creates anxiety. It also can maintain our anxiety, keep it in memory, and continue to produce anxiety over years and years and years. But it also is able to help us modify our anxiety responses and our, our fear responses and to help us to learn how not to react in an anxious way because the amygdala can always learn. Uh, unfortunately, the amygdala is in what we'd consider a less conscious part of the brain. That is, we're not really aware of the amygdala and it can have memories that we're not aware of and it can respond uh, faster than we can respond in terms of our thinking brains. And so it's not a conscious part of our brain that we're always in control of. The part of the brain that also contributes to anxiety that people are more familiar with is the cortex. And this is that curvy gray part of our brain. This is the thinking brain where we have our reasoning and our logic and our conscious memories are in this part of our our brain where the things that we're aware of that we can talk about the memories we know about. And the cortex is where we also have awareness where what's going on in our lives what we're seeing and hearing and feeling. It's our cortex that's giving us access to that kind of experience. The cortex is also very good at providing detailed information whereas the amygdala is going to be dealing with more of a quick and dirty picture of things and not go into all the details that the cortex can, can do. You can see that the, the different lobes of the brain are the part of the brain that's the curvy portion. Um, that is the cortex we're talking about. And the cortex is made up of, of different lobes that you don't really need to know about each of those lobes. Inside, deep within the brain, you have to kind of look carefully on the right side to see the amygdala. It's just a small, round part of the brain that's underneath the thalamus. And it is deep inside the brain. Both on the left side, there's one, and on the right side, there's one. If you learn the sources of these two sources of anxiety in your brain, you will be able to change your brain. Both the amygdala, the part that creates and maintains and modifies the anxiety, but also changing the cortex, that thinking brain. And in particular, I wanted to point out that in my book, I, I do some work on trying to help people identify what parts of anxiety are coming from the amygdala and what parts of the anxiety are coming from the cortex by giving you some surveys to fill out to help you to identify both of those different parts of the brain operating in creating anxiety. So let's start with the amygdala here for a moment. And the best way to think about it is to think of it as an alarm system in the brain. It, it has other functions in, in too, though. And I have to remind people often that we're not going to want to get rid of our amygdala in order to get rid of anxiety or fear because it does some very positive things. It helps us um, with attachment. It, it creates some positive emotions. It also creates um, aggression, which we sometimes need when we need to fight for ourselves. But in this case, we're going to be really focusing on just how it operates in terms of this alarm system function that gives a rise to anxiety. So what it, one of its jobs is to scan for danger signals. Whatever you're doing in your life and whatever your cortex is focused on, your amygdala is scanning the environment for any sign that there may be a danger. And it's capable of turning on a certain response we call the fight, flight, or freeze response in a matter of milliseconds, before you are aware of danger, your amygdala may be aware of danger. Now, the amygdala has these extensive connections in the brain, and it can influence a lot of processes in our body. It can influence the sympathetic nervous system, can change our hormone levels. It can also influence the cortex, turn the cortex off in a way, make it very difficult for us to think clearly or kind of feel like we're in a fog. That is part of what the amygdala can accomplish. And the amygdala um, that we inherit, as I mentioned, might be more or less susceptible to anxiety and more or less sensitive to potential dangers and more or less ready to set off the alarm. Some individuals are just more laid back and, and they don't, they're not as jumpy and, and don't go into alarm mode as easily. And some individuals are 
are more likely to um, be easily startled and easily become anxious or fearful or stressed. And we see this from the earliest earliest days of life. We can see that there are differences in people. We're going to try to consider these two separate systems, the amygdala and the cortex. And we're going to talk about how we have to consider them and how they work together and sometimes against each other. First of all, the amygdala is able to produce fear and anxiety responses without the involvement of the cortex. In fact, on its own, the cortex cannot create anxiety. If it were just to the cortex, we couldn't experience fear, we couldn't experience anxiety because that depends on the amygdala to be involved. And this is why in our cortex, our thinking brain, which is what we're most familiar with and the conscious part of our brain, this is why we we often don't understand our anxiety, where we say, why am I feeling anxious? I don't understand this. We're definitely feeling anxious, but our cortex doesn't understand it. And because understanding comes from the cortex, we have the difficulty of saying, this doesn't make sense to me and I don't understand it. But the amygdala, it is the part that creates the response. And it may decide that it's important for us to be anxious in a moment when the cortex doesn't get that, doesn't understand why should I be anxious at this moment. In fact, the amygdala can override the cortex. So in your cortex, you may be saying to yourself, stay calm and don't think about whatever it is that you, is the anxiety provoking thing that's occurring. Like, for example, maybe there's someone in a crowd that is um, that's listening to you give a speech, for example. And there's someone in on one side who's scowling at you and shaking their head. And, and you're in your cortex, you may say, no, don't look at that person, look somewhere else and just continue talking and just just ignore that. But the amygdala may keep directing your attention to that person. The amygdala might say, you need to look, you need to look, even though you're not hearing it say that. What is happening is your eyes just keep turning to that face and you just feel like you need to focus on that. That's because the amygdala can actually influence our thoughts and influence the focus of our attention. But Um, Anxiety can also be initiated by the cortex. That is, the amygdala can be calm and see nothing to be anxious about, and the cortex can produce some thoughts that can then start the amygdala to become anxious. So the way the cortex initiates anxiety is by imagining danger or alerting the amygdala by saying, oh my goodness, look at that. That's a dangerous situation that the amygdala might have missed. And we'll talk about some examples of that in the future. But this is how the two of these parts work together or don't work together in order to create anxiety. So you definitely need to consider both parts. That's the takeaway here. So let's start with how the amygdala creates anxiety. First thing I want to point out is that there are some fears that appear to be wired into the amygdala. That is, we seem very, very easily frightened of certain things. Many, many people have common fears. And these are people sometimes who've never been even exposed to these things that suggest that this could be built into our brains from the beginning. And it's the amygdala where that really is coming from. So let's say we have people who are afraid of snakes or heights or the idea of being watched by others, that others are looking at you. Those are things that we think are just very common fears that people have to deal with and um, are probably built into the amygdala. But we can, the, the amygdala can change and get over those fears. I don't want to say that that's impossible. And that's true, you can see, because there are often men hanging from skyscrapers, cleaning windows, who are ex- being exposed to heights. And obviously, their amygdalas are not afraid of heights anymore. So we know that the amygdala can change. Now, most fears that we're dealing with in our lives, though, are fears that have been learned. The amygdala has learned something is, quote, dangerous in its in its perspective, and it has stored that memory and it creates a fear response in response to that situation or object or those kind of things. But the amygdala does not learn in the way that you think about learning. When you think about learning and being in school and reading and writing and, you know, rehearsing things and talking about things and people giving you lectures... The amygdala does not learn in that way. The amygdala learns through experience. And that experience is going to be um, whatever you've lived through in your life, the amygdala learns from those experiences. And what it learns from are pairings of certain situations or objects, sounds or sights with something bad happening. 
And it's very important to recognize this is not going to be a logical process. For example, a woman who's sexually assaulted might have an amygdala then that responds to, for example, the song that was being played while she was sexually assaulted because that was paired with this terrifying traumatic experience. Even though that song did not cause the problem, the song was incidental because it was paired with it, the amygdala learns that that is a dangerous, dangerous sound. And it's not a logical process. So we can't expect anxiety and fear to be logical processes. What I'm talking about here is that what we need to do is to learn the language of the amygdala. That's the important thing. We're going to talk a little bit about the amygdala's relationship to the cortex. I've already mentioned that the amygdala can override the cortex, meaning that the amygdala can cause a person to focus on certain things, even though the person does not want to focus on those things. They can't take their mind off them. And that this can make it difficult for a person to concentrate or think clearly so that a person who's anxious And and under the influence of the amygdala activation of all these systems in your body, that person is going to have difficulty thinking and and directing their thoughts. And and it also can kind of paralyze a person and make the person feel that it's too dangerous to try certain things. They might feel it's too dangerous to get in the car. They, they They can't face that experience because as they approach it, it seems more and more and more threatening. And when they move away from it, their fear goes down. That experience is directly from the amygdala. So the amygdala, how do you control this then? You know, well, it can't be directly controlled by the cortex. All the thoughts that you have, like amygdala, back off, or stop being so afraid, or get a hold of yourself, Catherine. Anything I say like that to myself does nothing to the amygdala. Any kind of deliberate thought processes don't necessarily change anything in the amygdala. Unfortunately, the the, um, amygdala can be made more anxious by the cortex. So the cortex is kind of more likely to make things worse than it is to make things better. The amygdala can can, um, respond to dangers that aren't true, but that are just being imagined in the cortex. Many of us are very good at this. We can imagine something bad happening to us, and this can activate our amygdala, even though it's just an imaginary event in our brain. And then uh, as we're as we're experiencing these things, you can hear me talking about some things that are coming from the cortex and some things that are coming from the amygdala. And it's useful if you know when the amygdala is producing the response, because when you know that, then you can do things that are directly trying to respond to the amygdala. And it's good to know when the cortex is where the amygdala's response is beginning, when the cortex has started it, because then you know you have to kind of go to the cortex to to stop that process. So. Sometimes we need to focus on the amygdala, sometimes the cortex. And um, it is true that sometimes the cortex is where the anxiety begins. But remember, you can never have anxiety without the amygdala. The cortex can never do it on its own. We're going to remind you there's these two pathways to anxiety. And the key thing that will help you to feel these two pathways of anxiety is to know that the brain is wired in such a way that you are ready to respond to a threatening situation before you can think. And I'm sure many of you have had this happen when you're driving down the road, for example, and something comes across your lane and you quickly turn the wheel or hit the brakes before you've even had time to think enough to do it. And if you really experience that, you kind of watch yourself and you say, wait a minute, what just happened? Even though you did it, even though you moved the wheel and you hit the brake, This is because your brain is wired so you can respond before you can think. That means before your cortex is operated. That means that the the amygdala is able to trigger this thing that we call a stress response. And this is what the, the anxiety response is based on. This stress response of evading danger, which is triggered by the amygdala before you can think, is something that has saved countless of our ancestors. But the cortex, the thinking part of the brain, responds more slowly. And and, um, if you recognize that those are two different processes, there's a process controlled by the amygdala that often makes us react very quickly. And then our cortex kind of says, uh, I just did this. 
And it, it's more like you watched yourself do it because it happens so fast. You, that lets you know that there are these different parts of your brain that contribute to anxiety. And that can really help you learn how you need to modify your responses to address both of these parts. The key thing we need to know is just to say that whenever you're seeing something with your eyes, hearing something with your ears, all of this information is routed to a part of our brain called the thalamus. It's kind of like grand central station in the brain. And the thalamus sends that information wherever it needs to go to different parts of the brain in order for those parts of the brain to process it. So if you look at this, right in the center of the brain is where the, um, where the thalamus is. And that is kind of, it's difficult to see, but it's at the top of the brain stem. It's kind of a walnut shaped part um, in the center of the brain. And underneath that is where the amygdala is. And, and the thalamus sends information to the amygdala very quickly. Three different parts that we have to consider. The thalamus, where the information comes first. And then the fact that the thalamus is going to send that information whether it's a sight or a sound, to two different parts of your brain, to the amygdala, which the information gets to first, and to the cortex, which the information takes a little longer to get to and to get processed. The cortex is definitely slower. So you can see the thalamus is sending it to two different areas. The cortex is going to definitely respond more slowly. And I really want to say, when I say slow, it's still less than a second. So that's really fast. But it's slow compared to the amygdala, Because the amygdala can respond now in just a millisecond. So it's very quick. It's very quick. So we're going to break down these two pathways. All right. Let's look at the two pathways. But just look at the amygdala pathway. In this case, we're going to talk about Melinda coming into the basement. And when she's in the basement, she sees a, a shape that is what you see on the left of your screen here in this amygdala pathway. It's a shape that is dark against the background, and it's not really clear what that is. And this is often how the amygdala gets information from the thalamus because it has not been processed by the cortex into the detailed information that the cortex can give us. So what Melinda is likely to do when this information comes to her amygdala is her amygdala would register that as a potential danger, and it will produce the stress response, activating her sympathetic nervous system, Um, increasing her heart rate, increasing her breathing rate, um, routing, uh, releasing adrenaline into her system. And so that is where you can get a response from the amygdala. Now, if we look at um, the fact that she is going to jump back from from that shape because of her amygdala, not because of her cortex, and that information is coming directly to her amygdala before she herself, that is Melinda, is really completely aware of what she's seeing. So she reacts without thinking because her cortex is not involved. It's the amygdala that increases her heart rate and widens her pupils. It causes her to jump back quickly. It's the amygdala that processes this visual information independently more quickly than the cortex can. It's the amygdala can activate that sympathetic nervous system and cause the adrenaline to be released. It's the amygdala that doesn't have the ability to provide the detailed information and analysis we get from the cortex. Now, the amygdala can also respond in error, like it could react to something as if it were dangerous when it's not dangerous, but the amygdala operates on the idea that it's better to make a mistake about something being too dangerous and respond to make oneself safe than it is to not respond and leave the person in danger. So it is gonna err on the side of caution. And if it do- isn't sure if it's dangerous, it's better to respond as if it is dangerous. So it takes that, that protective response. So let's look at the cortex pathway. Now here's what's happening in the cortex pathway. This, this shape is sent to the, this, the visual of this shape is sent to the thalamus and the thalamus sends that information to the back of the brain, back in the occipital lobes in the cortex, where that information is going to be processed into something that we now, the people who have cortexes are able to see. And what happens is the cortex can more accurately identify that object and break it down into what it actually is in terms of some more details. Now, when that information gets to the cortex, which takes a little longer, 
then Melinda is going to be much more relaxed. But that information from the cortex has to make its way to the amygdala, which, as you remember, has already responded, is already responded. And when once the information is set, sent to the amygdala saying this is a suit coat and is not a dangerous object, then that information allows the amygdala to kind of cancel its responding and then her amygdala is not going to continue to respond. Unfortunately, I want to point out that once the amygdala has responded, you can't really put the genie back in the bottle. Once adrenaline's released, you can't stop it from continuing to have an effect. So that means that even though Melinda now recognizes it as, as a suit coat, her heart is still pounding and she's still feeling kind of a rush and feeling kind of uh, as if maybe she should have run away. But let's look at this cortex pathway in some detail. The cortex is going to allow us to process sensory information in detail that the, that the amygdala cannot provide. It is going to allow us to interpret information in much more detail. So it compares what information it gets, the memories that it has stored, and it can interpret what's experienced and that usually means a more accurate interpretation of the information. Like in Melinda's case, she recognized this is a piece of clothing, not a shadowy, frightening shape that might be a person that could threaten her. But the cortex is also capable of, of working the opposite way. The cortex is capable of taking a situation that is perfectly safe and turning it into a dangerous situation in our imagination. And we'll be talking about that later. So the important thing is to recognize that the in this example, the cortex was a source of relief, but the cortex can also be a source of anxiety-provoking thoughts. So back to the two pathways of anxiety together, because they're always working at the same time together. If we want to rewire the pathways, we are going to have to use completely different methods because the cortex learns so differently than the amygdala learns. So they're going to need different approaches, but I want to point out that each pathway can be modified in order to reduce anxiety. They definitely are capable of modification. So onward to talking about how we're going to first start with talking to the amygdala. How do we use the language of the amygdala? I want you to, to realize that the amygdala is not a logical part of our brain at all. And so we have to learn how to speak to it in the way that it talks. And that language is a language of association. Well, this language of association is a language of pairings, things that have been paired together in a person's experience. What happens is something called a trigger is created in a person's life when the amygdala detects a pairing between that trigger and some negative event that occurred that you can also have positive reactions conditions so that you can, for example, have very positive feeling toward a, a woman that reminds you of your grandmother because the amygdala has a positive association. So don't think the amygdala is all about negative emotions, but this is, this is um, the language of the amygdala is really about pairing. How does the amygdala produce a fear response? It produces a fear response to a trigger that's been paired with a negative event. Something negative has been happening and things that are associated with those that negative event are going to be labeled by the amygdala as dangerous, even though that trigger might not have caused the negative event. All that it's, it's looking at is pairing. That's what we're talking about. And when a trigger is paired with a negative event, then the amygdala is going to create a memory. And this is not a memory that you're going to experience in your memory, but the amygdala creates a memory, encodes a memory in our brain that connects an emotional response to that trigger. So then from then on, when the trigger is presented, the person is going to have an emotional reaction to that trigger. So for example, after experiencing, say, a sexual assault, which we would definitely talk about as a negative event, Lynn might have a very strong panic reaction wherever she, whenever she smelled the cologne that was worn by her assailant. That smell becomes a trigger because it is paired with the sexual assault. Even though it did not cause the problem, the cologne had nothing to do with, with the negative event occurring. It just was paired with it. So 
this is so important that you recognize that this is not a logical process. It's about pairings or associations being made. And the cologne can become a trigger for fear, even though that isn't logical. So your job then in your life is to, what we're going to talk about, recognize pairings. We need to recognize pairings that are happening. So when we're working with amygdala-based emotional memories, the kind of memories that the amygdala makes, these emotional ones, we don't have a memory of this because the amygdala creates these memories outside our awareness often, and we have no clue what it's doing. And that's true of much of the brain that we're not aware of all kinds of things our brain is doing. So this isn't just the only mysterious process happening in our brain, but because it's something that we don't understand, we have to look for those pairings ourselves, try to analyze the situation to recognize the pairings or the associations that lead to those, to those memories that the amygdala created. So if you want to think about the language of the amygdala, you have, need to remember that pairing a trigger with a negative event has a very powerful influence on your amygdala. And you cannot Reason yourself out of this. Reason is in the cortex, right? You're not speaking the the right language to the amygdala if you're trying to talk yourself out of anxiety. If you want to speak the right language, you need to focus on the pairings. So what's a trigger? Let's try to graph this out a bit, all right? First, just to say a trigger is a sensation, could like something you hear or see. It's an object. It's an event. And originally, it's neutral. So another way to look at that is that most people don't think that this is something that one should be upset about or anxious about. Like the smell of that cologne, other people would say, that's pretty neutral. So it doesn't typically lead to any specific emotional reaction. And so what we have here is a trigger. If you look at the little schematic there with a little box and the arrow, you have the trigger. It doesn't really cause any emotional reaction at first. And so... It could be something like the sound of a plane. It could be a little insect. It could be a concert that you're out in the public celebrating at a concert. Any of those things could be a trigger. And for most people, that trigger is not going to lead to an emotional response. Um, Recognizing associations or pairings can, can be accomplished if you recognize that triggers only produce fear responses when they have been paired with negative events. That's the thing that leads them to start to be Um, leading to a negative emotional response. So negative events, what are negative events? Negative events would be things, experiences that automatically cause you to have some type of negative emotional reaction. So we're going to look down at the the schematic here. Um, A negative event, now we have not a dotted arrow like we saw before, but we see a solid arrow because this is an automatic kind of thing. A negative event is something that when you experience it, you are going to have an emotional reaction, whether you want to or not. It's not something that's learned. So the amygdala, though, if there's some kind of a trigger paired with a negative event, then the amygdala takes notice and it creates an emotional memory about the trigger. And that is going to change how that amygdala responds to the trigger from that point on. The next thing you see here is that now the trigger is going to create a fear reaction. This is a learned reaction learned in the amygdala, and it's occurring because the trigger was paired with a negative event. The trigger, and now I want to say, even when it's presented by itself, like the cologne, not connected to the person who did the sexual assault, the cologne just in a, in a department store, in a per- place where the, perfect is, where the person is perfectly safe, that trigger presented by itself can cause the amygdala to produce a fear reaction. So you see what we have here is the trigger begins to cause a fear reaction here. And whenever the person sees or hears that trigger, the trigger is going to elicit a fear reaction and the person then experiences fear or anxiety. So bottom line here, in the amygdala, we have a fear reaction that has been connected with the trigger. And now every time that trigger is presented, whether it's cologne or the sound of screeching brakes or whatever it happens to be, that is going to now cause a person to feel a very uncomfortable fear reaction. So notice the connections that we're talking about here. This is what's going on in the brain 
we're making a connection that the negative event is the thing that produces an emotional reaction itself, right? The negative event, it isn't a learning process here. That negative event causes an emotional reaction. In other words, most people would have a negative emotional reaction to the event. But what is originally neutral is the trigger. And the trigger produces a fear reaction only because the amygdala has learned to respond that way. So people ask me, how do I figure out what the negative event was that caused me to have a response to a certain trigger? You know, I've worked with various people who will come in and talk about different kinds of fears and they'll say, how did I get this fear? Why do I have this problem? To figure out what the negative event is, you really want to consider, was there something negative that happened that most people have a negative emotional response to, like of discomfort or pain or embarrassment, irritation, something like that. And was there something thing that came before or at the same time as that negative event? You want to think with that trigger, was there anything distressing that was ever associated with that specific trigger? You know, so did the trigger occur in some situation that was upsetting? Now, the negative event is typically something significant and remembered by the person. But in some cases, the person doesn't really remember the trigger being in that situation. They don't, but the amygdala does remember, even though the person's cortex doesn't remember. When people ask me, how do I figure out what the negative event was? I often try to help them see if we can figure it out. But the main point here is it's really not necessary that you even remember or identify that negative event, because we can still change the amygdala's reaction to the trigger without knowing it. We don't have to know what originally caused it in order for um, us to get rid of the anxiety response. The trigger here gets paired with that negative event, the accident, right? So the negative event is the accident, something that automatically causes a negative emotional reaction for most people. We don't enjoy being in accidents. And there are a variety of triggers that Tom's amygdala may turn into to fear eliciting situations now. Could be the sound of the horn, could be the sight of a blue car, could be the sensation of braking. So let's just focus on the horn though, because we're using that example. So triggers are sights or sounds or smells or tastes or situations. And when they're experienced, the person feels fearful, anxious, or uneasy. And that is what a trigger is. Often other people don't get why the person's having a difficulty with this trigger. But for some reason, the trigger can result in this negative emotional reaction. Now, often if the person thinks about it, the person can remember a time when the trigger didn't cause any negative emotional reaction. They might say, for example, I used to be able to ride in the passenger seat of a car without being nervous, but now I can't do that anymore. Or I used to be able to be around dogs without being nervous, but now I can't do that anymore. And if the person can recognize in the cortex, um, they sometimes recognize the cortex that this doesn't even make sense that I'm having this fear of your dog, for example. But that recognition in the cortex doesn't change the emotional reaction to the trigger. The person experiences, you, you'll know a trigger because when you're around a trigger, you usually experience some kind of of emotional distress. And often you avoid these triggers, like you avoid dogs or you avoid riding in the passenger seat of a car. And often the person can remember the trigger was associated with a negative event. And in most cases, it preceded the negative event. So how do we use the language of the amygdala to reduce anxiety? If you understand the language, then you're going to understand your emotional reactions in a new way. You can see that your anxiety is really resulting from an inaccurate interpretation that the amygdala makes on the basis of this pairing. So for example, thinking that anytime you hear a horn, danger is going to befall you is obviously an incorrect interpretation, right? So if the amygdala reacts to the smell of cologne or the sound of a car horn as if they're dangerous, that's not an accurate interpretation because they're not. But knowing logically that the interpretation is inaccurate doesn't change anything in the amygdala. That is something that occurs in your cortex, and that logical knowledge that you have in your cortex does not re change the amygdala. But on the other hand, knowing that the amygdala's reaction is based on pairings, knowing that gives you a way to teach the amygdala. Now that you know that the amygdala learns on the basis of pairings, then you can give the, ex the amygdala new pairings, new experiences that will teach it to respond differently. So... This means that you should always remember that the amygdala needs experience to learn. 
it's going to continue to remember the things it's learned. And in fact, the amygdala has a really good memory. The amygdala is not likely to forget the associations that you learn. And it can keep producing anxiety responses for years and years and years. But you can change it if you give the amygdala experience to learn. If you give it the opportunity to learn a new pairing, to pair that trigger with something new. So when a new pairing is presented to the amygdala, by presenting the trigger and associating it with something positive or neutral, then the amygdala starts to learn a new association. And the new association is going to teach the amygdala to respond differently. The the amygdala definitely can learn if you know how to teach it. How do we teach it? We use something called exposure-based therapies. We talk about approaches that expose a person to the trigger and help them get over that fear. That there is a pairing that has occurred between the trigger and the negative event. And what we're going to try to do is to produce a new association with a positive event. How do we do that? First thing, I mentioned exposure therapies. They provide a new pairing that teaches the amygdala something new. If you see, if you break that pairing, in other words, you present the trigger, but not the negative event. That's breaking the pairing. Present the trigger, but not the negative event, but pair it with positive events or neutral events, then you can change the emotional response to that trigger. But you can't do this without presenting the trigger, whether it's the smell of the cologne, whether it's the horn honking, whether it's a dog, you need to present that trigger for the amygdala to get over it. And if you do that, you're going to get rid of that anxiety response because you will reduce that anxiety response if you present the trigger without a negative event occurring with either a neutral event, like nothing bad happens, or a positive event happening. And one thing I want to point out is you learn then to respond in a calm way, not in an anxiety way, in a calm way to that trigger. And this whole process, I should point out, people will sometimes say, so you just have to make sure the trigger is presented without anything negative occurring. And I say, yes, with one exception, anxiety is going to occur at first. So from the perspective of the person undergoing this situation, whether it's a dog or whether it's the cologne or whether it's getting in the passenger seat of a car after you've had an accident or hearing a horn, Anxiety is produced. So there is that negative, but I mean nothing negative occurring other than that. Not only do we change the amygdala through teaching it through exposure-based approaches like those and teaching it new associations, but some other things that are very important for people to know who are trying to manage their amygdalas. Relaxation strategies, like I'm talking about deep breathing, deep, slow breathing, muscle relaxation is another one, and also yoga. These things cause the amygdala to be less activated. So if you use these strategies on a daily basis, you're reducing your amygdala activation right then. And also, if you keep doing them regularly, you reduce the overall activation of the amygdala, meaning that the person is having... Um, an amygdala that is less likely to go off like an alarm. The alarm is kind of getting calmed down, I guess is a way to look at it, by these kind of strategies. Another thing is that exercise can turn off amygdala activation. So if you are activated um, because of hearing, say, a horn honk or something that's happened that is associated with with, um, your amygdala responding, if you go for a brisk walk or go for a run, that actually turns off amygdala activation. And if you do exercise regularly, then it reduces amygdala activation overall and gives you a calmer amygdala. So I've had individuals who come in and we simply work on increasing their exercise and they'll say, I feel less anxious just because I'm exercising. It reduces, And it's because it's reducing amygdala activation. The other thing is lack of sleep really destabilizes the amygdala. So it's very important for people who are anxious and anxiety prone individuals to to prioritize their sleep because if they get good sleep, they'll be less anxious. And if you don't understand or know this connection with the amygdala, it's very sad because sleep doesn't cost you anything. It's something that you can do. Sometimes I do have to do a little training with people because um, they have some things interfering with their sleep. But if you can increase your sleep it really stabilizes the amygdala. 
and I've had individuals who just changing their sleep schedule and increasing exercise have modified their level of anxiety just with those two interventions. And that's because these are directly targeting the amygdala and the amygdala is the part of our brain that creates anxiety. We're going to talk about the cortex and anxiety. I have to tell you, as humans, we are very proud of our cortex. We think our logic and our reasoning is amazing. And it really is. The, the things that we have accomplished with our cortexes, you know, just look, look around the world and people flying jets and these tall skyscrapers, our cortexes have made all that possible. Our cortexes are also, are also where our conscious memories are stored, what we remember from our childhoods, what we remember about knowledge um, in general and vocabulary. It, it gives us so many powerful things. But our cortex also make us humans much more prone to anxiety than other animals. Other animals don't sit around and think about bad things that could happen to them in the way that we do. Our cortexes bring up memories and have us go over a bad thing that occurred to us over and over so that we re-experience it and increase our anxiety. Also, it, it anticipates situations. Our cortexes make us think about situations ahead of time in a way that increases anxiety. And many of us are very good at, in, at imagining things that never happen. So the cortex can focus on situations that never occur, but seem very real, and they definitely activate the amygdala and initiate anxiety. So we're going to look at some cortex contributions to anxiety, how your cortex can create anxiety. The cortex can make a safe experience provoke anxiety. And on this slide, you see an example of a high school senior. This guy, he applied to several colleges. He was waiting for a response from the colleges and he looked in the mail and he saw an envelope from one of the colleges that he'd applied to. Now, his cortex imagines that that envelope contains a rejection letter. And as soon as he imagines that possibility, he has a few very anxious moments before he opens the envelope. But when he opens the envelope, as it turns out, he'd been admitted to the college, even got a scholarship. But notice how his cortex initiated this anxiety response by the way it interpreted the sight of the envelope. It was the interpretation of the envelope that created distressing thoughts. This is the kind of cortex-based anxiety that we have to watch out for. It depends on the cortex interpreting sensory information in a way that creates additional anxiety. And if you notice, the envelope is not a dangerous object. The amygdala itself would not have created anxiety in response to seeing an envelope, right? It's the cortex's interpretation that caused anxiety because when that information went from the thalamus to the cortex, the cortex imagined that's a rejection letter. And that's what made the amygdala go off. Not the letter itself, not the envelope itself. It was the idea that it was a rejection. The cortex can create anxiety when there is no relevant experience that a person should be feeling anxious about. So without any, without even any external sensations at all, just you can sit quietly in the dark and create worries and distressing thoughts that the cortex produces. And that activates the amygdala to produce an anxiety response, even though the person hasn't seen a thing or hasn't heard a thing, right? So an example that we could look at would be parents of an infant who for the first time they leave their little boy alone with a babysitter to go out for dinner, something they probably really need to do. And they're out for dinner and there's no evidence of problems, but the parents suddenly begin to have concerns about their child's safety in their cortexes, even though the boy's perfectly safe. His parents imagine he's in distress or being neglected. And so those thoughts and images activate the amygdala, even though there's no sensory information indicating the child's in danger. So let's look at the illustration of this. You have two individuals out for a very nice, nice dinner out on the town. The information that they're processing is probably about the taste of the wine and the taste of the food and the images they see around them in the restaurant. But unfortunately, worrisome thoughts are in the cortex. We have an imagination of the child being abandoned, for example. There's no one taking care of the child. And that thought activates the amygdala, just like we saw in the previous example. So as you can see, the cortex is completely capable of starting a problem when the amygdala has no indication that there's any reason to produce an anxiety response. So moving on, I want to point out here, if you look in these two blue shapes, 
and read what it says in those shapes. Could you just take a minute and read what it says in those shapes? This is an indication of why you shouldn't trust your cortex. If you read in the shape on the left-hand side, once upon a time there was a wizard, you are incorrect because it does not say once upon a time there was a wizard. It says once upon a a time. And if and your cortex probably took that extra a uh, out of there and didn't even let you see it because it knew it wasn't necessary. And on the other side, if you read that as I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, you were wrong because there's no two in that. It says I pledge allegiance to the flag. Our cortex will put things in and take things out that don't exist or that do exist and it doesn't think should be there. On the next slide, if you look at this, you're seeing the cortex adding information that's not there. If you see a white triangle, there's not a white triangle there. The lines that you see that make up that triangle are being put in there by your cortex. And the reason I show images like this is to point out if seeing can't be believing, it's important that you don't trust your cortex and think that just because you have a thought that your child is in danger or a thought that an envelope contains a rejection, that does not mean it's true. It's just a thought. Don't trust the cortex. So often the cortex can't be trusted to be accurately recording what's happening, but it's modifying the information that it sees or hears. So don't assume that what the cortex interprets or what the cortex processes is correct. So this is how your cortex can create anxiety. Keep in mind that your cortex is creating a version of reality. Don't mistake that for reality itself. And if you keep that in mind, this knowledge can help you reduce your anxiety. Because your cortex creates anxiety with, with the thoughts it produces, you can reduce your anxiety if you remember that your cortex should be questioned. The thoughts that are produced by your cortex are at least as likely to misrepresent reality as the images that you've seen in this presentation today. So thoughts that you have that come into your mind that your children aren't safe or thoughts that you're going to fail at something in the future, those are simply thoughts and they are not always correct. So here are some questions on this slide to consider in light of the fallibility of the cortex. First of all, the idea that asking yourself, have you spent time worrying that something would happen when it didn't even occur? Another one, have you assumed someone was disappointed in you when in fact they were not? Do you have a tendency to trust your worries and assumptions as accurate indicators of reality? Do you take your fears that you may not succeed as accurate and believe that success is unlikely? In other words, thinking because I'm afraid, that means I'm not going to succeed. Do you ever anticipate criticism that never occurs? And the amygdala can produce a response. And we, we need to rewire each of these pathways to change our responses and make our, our processes less likely to produce anxiety. And do images of potential difficulties that your cortex produces, do those present, prevent you from taking action? If you have a tendency to treat these kind of expectations, anticipations, and worries with more respect than they deserve, you're allowing your cortex to create a great deal of unnecessary anxiety. So remembering these two pathways, the cortex pathway and the amygdala pathway can both lead to anxiety. You've seen examples of how the cortex can be the source of an anxiety response created by the amygdala. And remember also that the amygdala is involved. Whenever the cortex is creating anxiety, the cortex can't do it on its own. The cortex might initiate it, but it has to poke the amygdala with the information for the amygdala to produce that anxiety response. And the amygdala can produce a response. And we, we need to rewire each of these pathways to change our responses and make our, our processes less likely to produce anxiety. If you look at the interpretations in a situation, you can really use your cortex to reduce anxiety. A source of anxiety in the cortex is the interpretations that the cortex gives us. And that is one of the most common ways the cortex creates anxiety. The way the cortex interprets a person's experiences is going to be the way that a person can have anxiety. So let's look at an example of a source of anxiety in the cortex. The cortex can create where you see an event that occurs, an event that occurs doesn't cause anxiety. It's the interpretation that occurs in your, in your cortex that leads to the emotion. 
not the event that leads to the emotion. See that even though most people believe events are causing a person to feel a certain emotion, like in other words, something happens and you just have to feel a certain way. The truth is that it's not the event, it is the interpretations that the cortex gives us. And that is one of the most common ways the cortex creates anxiety. The way the cortex interprets a person's experiences is going to be the way that a person can have anxiety. So in many situations, what the person thinks about the event determines how the person feels. One interpretation leads to one emotion and a different interpretation would lead to a different emotion. And what we're seeing here is the same situation depending on the interpretation leading to different emotions. So this tells you that you can use interpretations to reduce your anxiety. Because your interpretations influence your emotions, you can use those interpretations to reduce anxiety. Let's consider how a person could experience anxiety in the dinner situation. If Josh doesn't show up for dinner, what thought could lead a person to feel anxiety? Let's look at what could happen. If someone thought Josh was in a terrible accident, That idea could lead a person to feel anxiety. So if you use interpretations like that, then you're going to be anxious. If you use interpretations like, oh, this is a chance to spend time with my friend, you're going to be calm. If you use an interpretation that focuses on he doesn't respect me, then you're going to get angry. When we're in a situation in which you feel anxious, that's an opportunity to examine your interpretations. What interpretation is your cortex creating? If you can identify the thoughts, the worries, whatever it is that are leading to your anxious feelings, then that means you can work on changing those thoughts and worries. When you change what you think about the event, you don't change the event itself. You change how you think about the event. You change your emotional reactions. And this isn't an easy thing. It's much easier than calming yourself down once your thoughts have activated your amygdala. If you identify the interpretation that leads to anxiety, you can kind of question that interpretation. You say, wait a minute, how do I know he was in an accident? I'm not going to believe he was in an accident until I see some evidence of that. Now, when we're trying to change the cortex, we can call it rewiring the cortex. We want to be aware of our interpretations and consider if we change our interpretations, we can rewire the cortex. We can then take charge of our anxiety and other emotional reactions. If you change your interpretation, I'm not saying that's going to be easy. Take some concentration and and some trying over time. But if you change it, you can definitely reduce your emotional arousal in the situation. And so, I'm, and I'm also saying you may not always want to change your emotion. Maybe you need to get angry at Josh because he does stuff like this and you need to talk to him about your feelings. But what I'm saying is put yourself in control. Just alter your cortex's interpretations if you think it could help you to reduce your anxiety. The more that you practice doing these kind of things and, and thinking about anxiety resistant interpretations of events, the stronger those thoughts become and you're rewiring your anxious brain so it becomes less anxious and more resistant to anxiety. So looking at these cortex based approaches, one thing that we talk about is avoiding the anxiety channel. What's the anxiety channel? Thinking thoughts that increase a sense of danger. Coming up with images in your head that increase a sense of danger, like imagining your children harmed some way or anticipating situations that aren't present, thinking something's going to happen when it may not happen. And remembering events that produce danger and thinking about them over and over, even though they're in the past. Also worrying in general or or generating negative outcomes is another way to um, be on the anxiety channel. And what we say is change the channel, focuses on, focus on something that doesn't produce anxiety. Cortex-based approaches also have to do with challenging self-defeating beliefs. And some self-defeating beliefs would be expecting yourself to have perfect or near-perfect performance in everything you do. Should statements that this is the way things should be, she should act this way, or the world should be this way. Catastrophizing, taking something that's a setback and turning it into a disaster. And then being overly concerned about what others might think or how they might respond. These are all self-defeating beliefs that set you up to experience more anxiety. Instead, use coping thoughts, which are more realistic and reasonable expectations. Also, we, we encourage you in your cortex to not focus on or anticipate or exaggerate threatening situations. Don't make them worse than they are. And also, 
just telling yourself not to think something doesn't make that thought go away. You need to replace the thought with something else that prevents it from returning. And distraction is beneficial. Keep your cortex busy with more pleasant thoughts and playing, having a good time is really a good thing to do. So summarizing here, we're saying that there are certain approaches that target the cortex. Logical arguments definitely impact the cortex, not the amygdala. Um, You can have control over what your attention is focused on in your cortex and you can tell yourself not to focus on, on frightening ideas or don't scare yourself with your thoughts. Also, if you have a tendency to engage in in anxiety producing thoughts, you can work on reducing that. Distraction can be helpful. Keep yourself busy doing other things instead of thinking about the scary stuff. And mindfulness is a very beneficial thing. Now the language of the amygdala on the other hand, we talked about exposure exercises where you create new pairings. Uh, You expose yourself to things you're trying to change your emotion, emotional reaction of fear to, then you're teaching the amygdala new information. And notice, by the way, that distraction during exposure is not helpful. That's cortex-based. You don't want to do that during exposure. The amygdala has to have experience to learn. What can we learn about survival of the busiest? Well, this phrase is a good one to remember. If you're thinking about the cortex, survival of the busiest says that the thoughts you have the most, the parts of your brain you use the most, those are the parts that get stronger and stronger. So if you spend a lot of time on the anxiety channel thinking about possible things that could go wrong, or if you spend time rehearsing how you're going to deal with adversities that never happen, you are building up parts of your brain that are creating more anxiety. Your amygdala wouldn't be activated if your cortex weren't coming up with images that are negative images. So sometimes instead of focusing on those negative things, you should wait for it to happen to see if that worry was even necessary. And I bet if we if we search our, our memory banks, we're going to remember a lot of times when we had worries about my, like my daughter coming home late and I imagine she's been killed in a car accident and, and I'm just in a panic and my daughter comes in the door. Did I really need to go to those images and thoughts or did I need to just keep watching the evening news and keep and say, don't imagine negative things. You're only getting your amygdala activated because your amygdala wouldn't be activated if you didn't think those kind of traumatic thoughts. So many of us worry ourselves into more anxiety than we need. In other words, we we generate negative outcomes in our cortexes that may never happen to us in life, causing a lot of anxiety. You can keep that under control. Now, I'm not saying that a person shouldn't ever try to think ahead to a potential problem. But the the idea is to make a plan for that problem and then move on, not to be stuck in constantly rehearsing in our brains. That's the survival of the busiest. So you're actually creating more worry circuits in your brain as you do that and making your worry stronger and stronger. There's also the flip side where you can use your imagination to generate experiences in your mind where you see yourself in a stressful situation and that you respond in an empowering way and then that changes things so that in the future when those stressful events and stressors occur then you're retrieving a more and evoking a more peaceful response to it. Right, that tells you that when you're trying to get over fears of things like public speaking or spiders or whatever you can use your imagination You can sit there and in your mind, imagine giving the speech and it going well. You can imagine how you would step on a spider. And those things in your imagination actually are helping your amygdala to cope with those things. So it's important that you um, realize that the imagination that you have, the thoughts that you're imagining or the images you're producing in your brain are actually affecting your amygdala. And you can create more stress in your amygdala or you can create less stress and before say before a speech if you imagine it going very well and people responding positively you're probably going to be going into that speech with less anxiety than if you before that speech think a lot about possible failings and possible problems and negative reactions from people so we're really talking about knowing the connection between the cortex and the amygdala What if there isn't a specific trigger? So what would you suggest for those that have 
curiosities about generalized anxiety disorder. One of the things that we need to know is that generalized anxiety disorder is usually caused by an overreactive amygdala that a person has. So this is a person whose amygdala is is kind of hyperreactive. And when they worry about things, it often they often think that those worries reduce their anxiety a little, that they're coping, but actually they're like preserving the anxiety is what they're doing. So what I would say is think about it. if you have an overreactive amygdala, the deep breathing, the yoga exercises are going to target that amygdala directly. Also, exercise will reduce amygdala activation and to make sure you're working on getting enough sleep in your life. And you might not even think sleep has anything to do with your generalized anxiety disorder, but it has everything to do with that activated amygdala. So calming the amygdala down with all of those strategies. And then secondly, being aware that the more you think about your worries, the more likely you are actually increasing your activation in that amygdala. And so There should be time in your day where you play, where you focus on positive things, where you learn how to keep your worries in a box that maybe you only open certain times during the day and spend a limited amount of time with those worries. The rest of the time, you really should be focusing on more positive things. So generalized anxiety disorder is something we can really help with good sleep, exercise, and using things like yoga, which people might say, does that really have anything to do with generalized anxiety? Yes, it does, because the amygdala is the engine of the whole problem, and you're calming the amygdala down. And then you do what you can to keep the cortex from activating the amygdala. I'm thinking that if you if you have any kinds of health issues that contribute to, pro- to you, your worries, you're going to lead to problems. But just being dehydrated in and of itself isn't as detrimental, say, as, um, say, being tired. Being tired really makes a person more anxious. And for going to sleep, what are your thoughts about medication? The the good question about medication going, helping you go to sleep is that should always only be a temporary measure because it only works temporarily. Um, Cognitive behavioral interventions for sleep are much better at lasting. Medications work for a period of time than they're not effective. So we really encourage people to try to get help from with someone who knows CBT approaches. But with sleep itself, it's very important. The quality of sleep is important. You need to get at least seven or eight hours of sleep and not four hours of sleep and an hour of being awake and two hours of being asleep. You need to get that extended sleep because when we sleep, there's an architecture to our sleep. There's a pattern in our sleep. And if you don't get to those later hours of sleep and getting to a stage where you get frequent REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, that is very good for the amygdala and can calm the amygdala down. So working on getting good sleep in is in and of itself an important goal in reducing anxiety. It's a very important goal. Extended sleep, sleep that lasts at least seven hours, it will be much more effective at reducing anxiety. Humans seem to be more likely to become afraid of insects than guns, to be afraid of heights than of cars, even though up high is not as dangerous as cars are to us. So our amygdalas are not really operating on what's most dangerous. Some things are built into our amygdalas. And what would you suggest for somebody that's having a full-blown anxiety attack to help them relax and get back down to baseline? You know what? Once the amygdala is activated and we're in that fight or flight mode, You just have to wait for the body to settle down. And to tell you the truth, the better thing to tell that person is to tell them to take some deep breaths or tell them to go for a walk, do something physical, and wait for it to calm down and not to produce more signs of something the amygdala might respond to as threatening. So if you if you continue to, say, argue with the person at that point, that just makes the amygdala more worked up by the sense that there's a danger here. So what we're looking at is we're looking at how do you respond to the amygdala, not how do you respond to the cortex, because the cortex is pretty much offline when a person is in either a panic or a rage. Now the cortex is offline. So don't bother talking to the cortex and don't ask the cortex to talk back to you. You just want to give the person some time, some breathing. So for nothing complicated, but if you said something like things, this will, this will work out, we will work this out take some deep breaths. Why don't we go for a walk or, you know, go for a jog um, and and that'll help calm things down because now you're in a fight or flight mode. 
This is true with kids and with adults. The, these kind of cortex-based interventions of, of saying, how are you interpreting this situation? You know, you're expecting you're going to fail or you're expecting she's going to turn you down when you ask her out for a, a date. And that those expectations are getting your amygdala all worked up. Can, can we work on trying not to go to those kind of catastrophic interpretations, which teenagers are really good at doing. If you ask me about daily practices, I would tell you that if you want to have, if the amygdala is a source of all your fear and anxiety, if you want to have an amygdala that's calmer, if you exercise regularly and get decent sleep and commit yourself to those things, or you incorporate, say, yoga in your life, you are going to be a calmer person. That is just true. So that's kind of a daily thing. And then going back to this idea about cultivating courage, What we learn about the amygdala is the amygdala learns not from avoiding things, but by facing them. So if you're afraid of dogs, you will never get over a fear of dogs without being around dogs. And one of the things that's so powerful about learning these strategies for the amygdala, like exposure-based strategies, is, for example, a woman that had not been able to learn to drive, she was very afraid of driving, didn't want to get behind the wheel, worked with her on this. And what I said is, Your amygdala is very afraid of getting behind the wheel, but we know that's not logical, right? So what we're going to do, put you behind the wheel of a car. Just, I'm just talking in a safe place. We went to a cemetery, actually. No one's around. We're sitting in the middle. She just gets behind the wheel of the car. Immediate panic, right? Afraid and doing it anyway. She sat behind the wheel of that car. She just sat there and and we just waited for her fear to go down. And within four minutes, she started, I can feel it starting to go down. And then she said to me, Just being in this position is teaching my amygdala something. And I said, yes, your amygdala is learning. It's not dangerous to be behind the wheel of a car. It can't learn from all the things I've said to you, all the things your dad and mom have said to you. But sitting in this, it learns from this experience, being being exposed to being behind the wheel of a car. And she said, this is how I can change my anxiety. It's very empowering. So working with courage is facing your fears. And you know what the good thing is? It changes your fears. It reduces your fears. Many people think if I face my fear, it means every day I'm experiencing anxiety. I'm experiencing anxiety. They don't realize the amygdala learns. It changes as they face their fear. And it starts to say, that's not bad. And then this woman who didn't think she could drive started driving cars because she just knew if I keep getting behind the wheel and I just make myself drive a little bit my fear goes down and down and down. And she had learned how to change her fear. So it takes courage to change fear. Courage is not acting in the absence of fear. Courage is acting despite fear. And the good news is it changes your fear. It reduces your anxiety. It changes you and you become a different person. Your fear is reduced. Many people think if I face my fear, it means every day I'm experiencing anxiety. I'm experiencing anxiety. They don't realize the amygdala learns. It changes as they face their fear. And it starts to say, that's not bad. And then this woman who didn't think she could drive started driving cars because she just knew if I keep getting behind the wheel and I just make myself drive a little bit, my fear goes down and down and down. And she had learned how to change her fear. I see people who couldn't go on a honeymoon because they couldn't get in a plane, getting in the honeymoon and sending me pictures of them on the beach, you know, in in um, on an island in the Bahamas and just seeing people overcome their fears. It's amazing. And we know how to do it. We know how to communicate using the language of the amygdala. So just talk to the amygdala the way it needs to be talked to. your, Your brain will change. You can rewire your anxious brain. You can do it. Well, thank you so much. That was Dr. Catherine Pittman, author of Rewire Your Anxious Brain, How to Use the Neuroscience of Fear to End Anxiety, Panic, and Worry. And if you're looking for online therapy to get rid of anxiety or overcome fear, visit reprogrammingmind.com forward slash therapy to match with the right licensed therapist for your needs and apply the code CARE, C-A-R-E, to start your therapy with a 30% off discount. That's reprogrammingmind.com forward slash therapy. Bye for now.